Hello, everyone. It's a great honor to be with you here for the India Inclusion Summit. I've been looking forward to this, and it's, it's a great joy for me to be with you. Um, I want to start by just asking each of you to think about your own school experience, whether you're still in school or whether it's been many years ago. Think back to a classroom from your childhood uh, or from your school now and look around that classroom and let me know if you see or think about whether you see students with and without disabilities working together, collaborating, and learning together. I'm going to guess that many of you saw no students with disabilities in your class. And that's pretty much the way I grew up as well. When I was young here in preschool, I never thought about kids with disabilities because I barely saw any kids with disabilities until I saw a young boy, a friend of mine, who had a difference. And what was unusual about this boy, if you can see in the picture, was he wore a headband around his ears. And at the time, that felt like a really big difference. He was the boy with the headband. But looking back now, that seems like such a minor difference. I remember coming home and asking my mother one day, why does that boy wear the headband all day? And she said, well, he's had some ear surgeries and he needs to protect his ear. And I think back to that now and think, hmm, that was the boy with the headband. That was such a difference. But in reality, that is such a small difference now that I look back at it. And that's because of my own life experience. When I look back now, almost 20 years, when my wife was pregnant with our second child, we had Isaiah, a three-year-old who was running all over the beach, very active, talking, energetic. Uh, and we were looking forward to having that second child and envisioning the family that we might have, the adventures we would have together, hiking and biking. Um, and then one day, Samuel was born. A beautiful child. We had a beautiful birth. Um, and for those first few months, we were exhausted, but we were exhilarated, happy, uh, until a few months into his life, and we started noticing he wasn't developing in the same way as his brother. He wasn't rolling over. He wasn't trying to sit up. He wasn't talking. And we started getting a little concerned. So we called the doctor, and the doctor said, well, let's have him checked out by a physical therapist and a speech therapist. And they said, hmm, just to be sure, why don't we have him seen by a neurologist? And at about six months old, the neurologist started doing all these samples of Samuel's blood, his skin, his urine, all these samples going all over the world to analyze why wasn't Samuel developing in a typical way. And at that point, as a parent, you're just so worried. And you're thinking every day, I just want to get that news from the doctor that everything's going to be OK. He just needs that one pill and everything will be fine. The doctor sent skin samples and blood samples all over the world. And after about a year into Samuel's life, he came back and told us that it looks like Samuel has an underlying genetic disorder that has caused cerebral palsy. And you can see now in those fists balled up, that was the early sign of cerebral palsy. So we went from this place of just joy and excitement to a place that was really just full of uncertainty. And that's a tough place to live, to live in uncertainty of not knowing uh, you know, whether Samuel's health was going to take a turn for the worse, how long he might live. You know, how could he go to school when he can't hold a pencil? How can he have friends when he can't just run outside and play with his friends? Just test after test after test and concern after concern. And we realize we can't live in this place of fear and concern. We have to find a better way. Uh, so we have to find a vision for Samuel's future. My wife was fortunate to go through a family leadership training, and she was able to come to this idea that, you know, Kids with disabilities can be included in school. They can be included in community. They can take part in every aspect of our lives. Um, and she said, Dan, you have to do this same training. We have to be on the same page as parents and form this vision for Samuel. So I went ahead and did that training. And what we both came to was that our vision for Samuel would be that he would feel like he belonged. He would feel like he belonged in every aspect of our lives, um, in our family, in our extended family, in our neighborhood, in our community, and most certainly his own elementary school right down the road from our house. We just couldn't imagine how Samuel could ever feel like he truly belonged if he didn't have a place of belonging in his own school. So Samuel, thankfully, always felt like he belonged. <laughs> he was a charmer. He would just lean over to the girl next to him in preschool, flash those eyelashes, and he definitely felt like he belonged in preschool. As he got older, and he went into elementary school, first grade, second grade. Um, he felt like he belonged with his friends. He was he was supported sometimes quite literally, like for this group photo, uh, along with his friends in elementary school. When he got interested in things like theater, 
he felt like he belonged on that stage in a production of Guys and Dolls here at his elementary school. And he used a communication device to start communicating and saying his lines. And nobody, nobody gave it a second notice because they had been with him in school all day long. And they knew that that's just the way that Samuel uh, took part in, in the world. As he got even older, he wanted to play sports. So oh, he couldn't run the first baseline in baseball, but he could use his adaptive bike with a little help from his coach to get up the first baseline. Sometimes he was safe. Sometimes he was out. He was just playing the game with his friends, but he felt like he belonged. That sense of belonging has continued through his life, thankfully, because he's worked hard to advocate for himself, and we've worked hard to advocate for his inclusion in all aspects of society. And he and his brother, Isaiah, are now 24 and 20 years old and still very, very close. Um, and in his upper levels of school, he started participating in high school sports. And here in the United States, uh, actually it's worldwide, a program through the Special Olympics called Unified Sports, in which kids with and without disabilities compete against other school teams of kids with and without disabilities. So he felt like he belonged on that soccer field. As he got even older and he started taking part in more school activities, he joined a, a group called the Be the Change Club here in New Hampshire, where we live. We've had a tremendous amount of, of refugee resettlement from all over the world, from Syria, the former Yugoslavia, Iraq, Bhutan, um, and they've come and settled into our community, many people from Africa as well. And Samuel wanted to be part of that welcoming spirit in our community. So he joined the Be the Change Club and he felt like he belonged while he was trying to help other people felt like they belonged. He got involved in the TV station and he started doing a sports broadcast every morning for the entire school of 2000 kids. They got to know him that way. And then most recently he started working with me and with other people on film projects. Here there's a, the legendary disability rights advocate, Judy Human. Uh, we went down to Washington DC and did filming with Judy. And so now he feels like he belongs professionally and he's got a job making films that he loves. Now you might think that Samuel, you know, um, doesn't see himself in a relationship or with a girlfriend. Well, that's not true. He very much wants to get married and have kids someday. And he has great role models for that. And here you see him with his, his close friend, Anita, at the high school prom. And then just days later, you'll see that Samuel was graduating from school, from high school and getting his diploma with a regular diploma, which of course set him up to achieve his dream to go to college. He's always thought of himself as somebody that would go to college like his brother, like his friends. And now, I'm thankful to say that Samuel is a college student uh, working towards a two years associate's degree here in New Hampshire, sometimes bringing his service dog Proton along into class. So Samuel feels like he belongs in every aspect of society. And of course, I'm very proud of Samuel and who he is. But the reality is that Samuel is representative of the research that we have in this country about inclusion. And when I say this country, I actually talking about the United States, but this is also validated by worldwide studies that says that kids with disabilities who are included in regular education classes end up having better communication skills, higher academic achievement, wider social networks, fewer behavior problems, more opportunities for higher education and meaningful employment as adults. So Samuel is actually representative of the research, but unfortunately the research also shows tremendous segregation in this country and worldwide. One stat from the United States says that 56% of kids with intellectual disabilities are spending the majority of their day segregated in separate classrooms away from their typical peers. Um, they are segregated systemically. So why do we segregate kids with disabilities in our society and in our world when we know that is not going to generate the most positive outcomes for them? Well, I have a couple theories on this. Um, I think it's not just about Samuel when I have to think about this theory. I think it's actually more broadly about making the case that inclusion and inclusive education benefits all kids, kids with and without disabilities. And I'll just share briefly a great study by a researcher at Vanderbilt University, Eric Carter, who studied different groupings of kids working, preparing for a test. In one group, there were kids with and without disabilities preparing for the test. In another group, it was just kids without disabilities. So one group was very uniform or monolithic, just kids without disabilities. The other group was a mixed group. And they found that the kids without disabilities in the mixed group were actually achieving 15 points higher on their exams. And they found that was because the kids were more engaged in the curriculum. They were co-teaching and working with their students, their peers with disabilities to try and explain the material. 
They were more engaged in the curriculum. It was a more vibrant discussion. It was a better learning environment for the kids without disabilities to be in that diverse environment. So they were scoring better on their tests because they were more engaged in the curriculum. And there's actually been no studies to suggest that students with disabil without disabilities who are learning in inclusive classrooms have any shortcomings in their academic experience. But there's also the whole social and emotional part of going through school. I think part of it is academic, but part of it is becoming the full person that you're going to be later in life. And I can think of no better example of that than an experience that Samuel had with two of his friends, Jacob and Fletcher, going to a community a few hundred miles from here called Cooperstown, New York. It's where the, the Baseball Hall of Fame, the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame is located here in the United States. So we had a great time going through the museum and seeing the exhibits in the museum. And then we went out to the community. And if you look at this picture, you'll see that there was a really big obstacle to getting into stores and restaurants in the community. Every single store on this block had a little step about this big. And when you use a, a wheelchair, especially a power wheelchair, that step is like a wall. You cannot get into that store. So the kids were really upset that they and their friend Samuel, it took them 45 minutes just to find a place to have lunch in this community. So when they got back, they decided to write a letter. And that letter said things like, we are very mad because almost all of the stores in downtown Cooperstown are not accessible to someone in a wheelchair. We had $100 to spend and we had a rule. If Samuel couldn't get into the store, then none of us would buy anything from it. We hope that this letter will change downtown Cooperstown before anyone else has to struggle with what we did. And they sent the letter to the city chamber of commerce, the business organization and all the newspapers and it got published. And a few weeks later, I got a call from the city saying, oh, it's so great that your son and his friends wrote this letter. You know, what can we do to make downtown Cooperstown more accessible to people in wheelchairs? And I'm thinking ramps, ever heard of ramps? They've been around since the pyramids. <laughs> There's gotta be a way to build ramps. But I'm also thinking, why are you calling me hundreds of miles away? Don't you have in your own community, people who use wheelchairs, you know, architects, urban planners? Anyway, the great end of the story is that a few couple years later, a friend of mine who has family in Cooperstown <clears throat> went back into town and found that they had rebuilt downtown Cooperstown and made all the streets and stores accessible. And it was just absolutely thrilling to think that maybe, maybe that letter had a little impact. You know, they may have been planning this for a while. Maybe the letter didn't do so much, but think about the lesson that it taught Samuel and Jacob and Fletcher about human rights, about civil rights, about standing up for a friend, about the fact that everyone needs to feel like they belong in our society. That is the powerful lesson they learned, which they would have never learned if Samuel hadn't been their friend, if they hadn't grown up with Samuel and taken this trip with Samuel. Those are the kind of life lessons around civil rights and human rights that you don't learn unless you grow up in a diverse environment. So certainly it's about Samuel, certainly it's about you know kids without disabilities and his friends, but it's also about our future as a world, as a society. It's about our future sons and daughters. It's about future cousins and grandchildren and nephews and nieces. What kind of world do we want them to grow up in? I would maintain that I want them to grow up in a world where disability is seen as a normal part of the world, where disability is seen as part of our diversity that we should embrace. And I don't think you can learn that lesson unless you experience it, experience that diversity from a very young age. So finally, I just want to tell one quick story from back from Samuel when he was in elementary school. He was in a wonderful classroom in elementary school, and it was a multi-age classroom. There were kids who were five, six, seven, eight, all studying together in this classroom. And Samuel, with his teacher, Barbara O'Brien, who you see on the left side of this photo, um, Samuel was with this teacher for three straight years. And the students he was alongside of in the classroom were with him for three straight years. And so one day when a little child came from another country, from Africa, and came to this classroom knowing no English language, knowing nothing about American culture or customs, all the kids in the classroom showed incredible empathy and patience and love and support. And they were very innovative in the way that they communicated with this child. And they showed such you know, leadership and teamwork and creativity in finding a way to make this child feel successful. Those are the skills they developed. And Ms. O'Brien said to me, you know where they learn those skills? They learned them from Samuel. So when you think about those skills that I just mentioned, creativity, communication, innovation, collaboration, right? Empathy, patience. Those are skills that not only are great 
growing up with, those are the kind of skills that employers are looking for. Those are the kind of skills that will launch you into the world. These are the skills that Samuel taught these children, and these are the skills that Samuel continues to teach me every day. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor, and enjoy the rest of the India Inclusion Summit.